Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for being here. I know that it's a Saturday during Advent, during December, pre-Christmas, end of the semester, beginning of all the holidays. <laughs> it's, so I know this is a really busy, crazy time, but I really appreciate you coming out um, to engage these conversations. Um, I am always so happy every time you all show up for these conversations. It makes me feel like I'm with like-minded people who are all eager to just lean in and, and say, we like maybe this is not necessarily my field, but I'm curious about what is going on in this field and how we can be thinking about this together as a community. Um, I feel like even just this past two weeks maybe has been a big educational curve for me as this is so not my field, not my area of expertise, but it is so much fun to know that there are other people, other experts who can help guide us in what is going on. And what I do relate to, what I do understand is um, the challenge of bringing your Christian faith into a community, into a work environment, and trying to figure out how your, your faith and your career mix. So we are talking specifically about science um, in particular today. So just a few, I think most people who are in this room already know these things, but um, the building, we have other people who are in the building, other events that are going on in the building. So um, Emmanuel is here kind of feeding uh, other people in our community. So they're using this outside area. So if we just avoid kind of walking through the traffic that they have going on, that would be great. Um, the, if you do need to use restrooms, of course, those are down the stairs. So you can go out that way and go down the stairs, but just be mindful of the fact that other people are, are in the building. So today, for this particular conversation, we're going to do it a slightly different format than we've done in the past. So uh, Dr. Jeff Harden is going to do the lecture part. We'll do a really quick Q&A at the end for any burning questions that you may have and observations. And then we're going to have a panel discussion. So we, because we're in this Penn area, Philadelphia area, we have some really incredibly brilliant minds among us. And so we're bringing in people from the resurrection community who have related careers, but, but have different perspectives because they're seeing things at, at the different line um, as you go down the, the progress of the scientific research. There's people seeing different elements of that. So we're gonna do a conversation related to that and then we should be done close to noon. Um, so I'll say for me, um, I'm, I feel like I'm gonna be the, the um, can, you, can you tone it down for the normal people moderator? <laughs> because again, this is kind of outside my field and so there's a lot of um, as all of us in our fields of expertise, right, we, we start to use shorthand for things that make a lot of sense, but maybe not everyone understands that. But I do know that gene editing has um, brought about so much potential, even in the realm of food and food production, which is something I do care very deeply about. Um, gene editing has played a big part and might in where we go in the future related to food production. Um, so there's potential for all kinds of significant good, including, of course, disease alleviation, which I think we'll be talking about today. Um, but then there's also potential negative effects, whether they're intended or unintended. And so the timing of some of the push towards the development and research is something I'm curious about personally. Uh, so I feel really honored that we have an expert with us today. So Dr. Jeff Harden has an MDiv, which he did prior to his PhD, um, and then PhD and postdoc and all of, all of the great other titles that you add on. But the MDiv-PhD combination is really interesting because it, it means that there's a built-in consideration of uh, science and theology and how these actually can be in conversation together. 
So he's the professor in the Department of Integrated Biology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where his research focuses on embryonic development using, if I have this correctly, I hope this is correct, using model organisms like sea urchins in order to, dis, uh, to study how human organisms work. I hope I got that right. You can correct me if I got that wrong. Um, so there's implications of this, of course, in understanding how human, human diseases, including cancer. So he's an accomplished researcher, has published a number of academic journal articles, co-authored a cell biology textbook, and yet often makes time to have these conversations of faith and science, whether it's in churches or with student groups that are on campus. So I look forward to how Dr. Jeff Harden can lead us in this conversation. So will you join me in welcoming him? Thank you. Well, it's good to be with you. Uh, thank you, Cindy, for that introduction. Most of my research now focuses on little worms called Cenorhabditis elegans or C. elegans a noble creature, uh, also like sea urchins. Um, uh, I, I do wanna make one correction. And that is that Cindy used the word expert. And that is absolutely not true in my case. So I'm a basic biologist. We use genome editing in my lab all the time to engineer these little worms. But the topics we're gonna be talking about today are much bigger, much wider, much deeper than the very narrow confines of my laboratory. So I am looking forward to thinking together about this topic that, that we have before us and learning from the other panelists and from all of you. So rather than viewing what I'm gonna say as a lecture, view it as an introduction that can prime the pump for our discussion. That's what I hope will be true today. <clears throat> Now, I'm pretty old. I am 62, and um, I just hit the 30-year mark as a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, and uh, maybe others have hit that milestone recently. So, um, and um, if we just look at the pace of biotechnology as it relates to humans in my professional lifetime, uh, since I graduated from high school, we'll just start with my college career, just think about what, what's happened. 1978, Louise Brown, the first, quote, test tube baby. Surrogate motherhood followed not uh, long after that in the 1980s. Other reproductive technologies came after that, freezing embryos, uh, manipulating the reproductive tract, those kinds of things. 1997, Dolly the sheep, the first mammal who was cloned by somatic cell nuclear transfer. Um, on my own campus, uh, in 2001, human embryonic stem cell culture techniques were developed by Jamie Thompson. In 2003, the draft of the first, the first draft of the human genome appeared. In 2006, we'll, we'll come back to this, something called induced pluripotent stem cells were developed. In 2013, someone successfully did a cloning experiment similar to Dolly the sheep in humans for the purposes of so-called therapeutic cloning. And in 2017 was the first proof of concept that you can do genome editing on human embryos. This is all in my professional lifetime. And it's not just that these things have happened, it's the pace of developments seem to be accelerating at an amazing rate. So I feel like we are all on a technological bullet train to somewhere. And the question is, where are we going? Who should be in that discussion? How should uh, in my case, my Christian faith influence how I think about the direction of that bullet train that we're all speeding forward on. So uh, we wanna talk about uh, uh, some of these issues today. One of the things I want to say at the outset is that science cannot answer some of the key questions about whether we should perform certain kinds of experiments, whether certain technology should be applied to humans. And even someone who's most profoundly not a religious person, James Watson recognized this. He said, the belief that surrogate mothers and clonal babies are inevitable because science always moves forward 
represents a laissez-faire nonsense dismally reminiscent of the creed that American business, if left to itself, will solve everybody's problems. Science needs to be shaped by ethical, moral, and uh, spiritual sensibilities in ways that on its own it has no resources to do. And it's not just for experts. I wanted to debunk quickly that the idea that I am an expert in this field, I'm most certainly not, but I'm thinking about it just like many of you are. And the eminently quotable um, British author G.K. Chesterton said it well, if the ordinary person may not discuss existence, why should he or she be asked to conduct it? We all need to be thinking about these issues and I hope you'll help me think with you about them today. But why should a Christian respond? I am a Christian. Uh, I have been for much of my life, and um, so uh, that's the grid through which I think about these things, and that may be true for many of us in the room, but not all of us. So why should a Christian respond? Well, first of all, the 21st century, the century we're in, many have dubbed it the century of biology because of these technological developments, and it's very likely that many people here or your loved ones, maybe one or two degrees of separation from you, will need to decide about uh, whether these technologies are ethically permissible. So you're gonna be faced with some of these decisions in your own life. And uh, Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5.13 said, you are the salt of the earth. So as a Christian, I think it's important that we in the Christian community are, are in dialogue with people uh, of other faith traditions, and but that our voices are, um, thoughtful voices that can engage with, with other people thinking about these technologies. What we wanna talk about mostly uh, this morning is genome editing. So let's talk a little bit about what that is. What is genome editing? This is the high school biology view of our topic, okay? So hopefully everyone came through high school and at least had some biology class. Now my high school biology was my freshman year in, in uh, high school. So if that's true for you, I'll try to keep it simple. And that's, uh, that was Cindy's plea earlier, I think. All right. So hopefully you know that DNA provides the information for making other molecules. Many of those are proteins. So there is a DNA code that can be read out three building blocks at a time to string together a group of protein building blocks called amino acids. So if you know the code of DNA that provides the information to make a protein, you can dink with the DNA, and this will in turn alter the protein that is made. So if we edit the code, we will edit the molecules that the DNA provides the information to make. So that's the fundamental idea here. There's a couple of ways that we can do that. One way is to modify proteins by having fun with DNA. So we can modify proteins, and then the proteins have different functions, or we can tag a glowing piece to them or do other kinds of things. In other cases, we can edit DNA that acts like a DNA switch. Uh, and if you know a lot of molecular biology, you'll know what I mean here, and you have more technical phrasing for these kinds of switches. But the idea here is that we can edit the switches that regulate when that code gets read out in a particular cell at a particular time in a particular way. So that's what we mean by genome editing, is that we're going to change this stuff up here and it's going to affect this stuff down here in predictable ways. Now, it's DNA. So you know that DNA provides the genetic information for organisms and it gets replicated every time cells divide and it gets packaged into eggs and sperm, in the case of humans, that get together to make a new human organism. So changes in the DNA, if they wind up in the cells that make eggs and sperm, are heritable. They can be inherited, passed on to the next generation. And that's a key point that we'll come back to. So that's very powerful because if you make the edit once, then subsequent generations will carry forward the edit that you make in a particular piece of DNA. Uh, there are different ways to do genome editing. The easiest and the most prevalent today involves uh, a, a technology called CRISPR, and then it involves a protein called Cas9. I'm only gonna list the acronyms once, and then I'm just gonna say CRISPR. It's like the CRISPR drawer in your refrigerator, that's how you pronounce it. All right, so 
Um, CRISPR stands for, ready, Cindy? This is just to dazzle you with my technical brilliance. Clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. These are bits of DNA that are part and parcel of how this machinery works. That's all I'm gonna say. But in case you wondered what CRISPR stands for. CAS stands for CRISPR associated genes. And one of these, CAS9, there are other CAS genes, uh, is a CRISPR associated protein uh, that's programmed by little bits of, of something called RNAs to cut DNA. All you need to know about this molecular machine is that when we add in the right guides, it can be targeted like a heat-seeking missile to a particular piece of DNA within a cell. And once it's targeted to that particular piece of DNA, it can cut the DNA in predictable ways. And then it turns out that your cells are great at repairing breaks in DNA. You have this machinery that's working in your cells moment by moment as we're sitting here to repair problems with your DNA. And if you give the cells something to use when they try to do that repair, you can swap out a piece of DNA for a different piece, as we'll see in the, in the video in a moment. So that's what this is. And uh, we don't really need to know these details. Um, if you're wondering where did this come from, it came from bacteria. Basically, it's a way that bacteria use to fight off viral infections called bacteriophages that attack bacteria. We are dealing with some viruses as humans right now, but well, bacteria do too. And they have this means of sort of mounting an immune defense against viral attack. All right, so that's the background. And if you figured this out and you learned how to apply it in various ways, well, at least in the case of two of you, you get a Nobel Prize for that. So this is Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier. And they realized the applications of CRISPR and developed some of the basic molecular biology techniques. Uh, these two guys, uh, Feng Zhang and George Church, uh, really pushed development in eukaryotic cells, in particular um, mammalian cells. We happen to be mammals. And so they developed some of the applications that eventually uh, will be, uh, have been specifically used in, in human cells. Now there's an interesting backstory here about patents and lawsuits and because there's big money at stake in commercial development of these technologies. That's fascinating. We're not gonna talk about that, but just FYI. All right, so here's a little movie that shows the basics of how CRISPR-Cas9 works. And I, I think we're good to go with the audio. We, we, we tried it beforehand. Let's give it a go. Every cell in our body contains a copy of our genome, over 20,000 genes, 3 billion letters of DNA. DNA consists of two strands twisted into a double helix and held together by a simple pairing rule. A pairs with T, and G pairs with C. Our genes shape who we are as individuals and as a species. Genes also have profound effects on health, and thanks to advances in DNA sequencing, researchers have identified thousands of genes that affect our risk of disease. To understand how genes work, researchers need ways to control them. Changing genes in living cells is not easy. But recently, a new method has been developed that promises to dramatically improve our ability to edit the DNA of any species, including humans. The CRISPR method is based on a natural system used by bacteria to protect themselves from infection by viruses. When the bacterium detects the presence of virus DNA, it produces two types of short RNA one of which contains a sequence that matches that of the invading virus. These two RNAs form a complex with a protein called Cas9. Cas9 is a nuclease, a type of enzyme that can cut DNA. When the matching sequence, known as a guide RNA, finds its target within the viral genome, the Cas9 cuts the target DNA, disabling the virus. Over the past few years, Researchers studying this system 
realized that it could be engineered to cut not just viral DNA, but any DNA sequence at a precisely chosen location by changing the guide RNA to match the target. And this can be done not just in a test tube, but also within the nucleus of a living cell. Once inside the nucleus, the resulting complex will lock onto a short sequence known as the PAM. The Cas9 will unzip the DNA and match it to its target RNA. If the match is complete, the Cas9 will use two tiny molecular scissors to cut the DNA. When this happens, the cell tries to repair the cut, but the repair process is error prone, leading to mutations that can disable the gene, allowing researchers to understand its function. These mutations are random, but sometimes researchers need to be more precise, for example, by replacing a mutant gene with a healthy copy. This can be done by adding another piece of DNA that carries the desired sequence. Once the CRISPR system has made a cut, this DNA template can pair up with the cut ends, recombining and replacing the original sequence with the new version. All this can be done in cultured cells, including stem cells, that can give rise to many different cell types. It can also be done in a fertilized egg, allowing the creation of transgenic animals with targeted mutations. And unlike previous methods, CRISPR can be used to target many genes at once, a big advantage for studying complex human diseases that are caused not by a single mutation, but by many genes acting together. These methods are being improved rapidly and will have many applications in basic research, in drug development, in agriculture, and perhaps eventually for treating human patients with genetic disease. So that's a great video, fantastic. Said it much more concisely and better than I could have said it. So I think you get the idea. CRISPR-Cas9 is one form of genome editing, and uh, really all you need to think about is that it's a way to position molecular scissors at a particular site, cut DNA, and replace it with something else. That's really what we're doing here. And uh, if you remember this molecular scissors idea, but that we can target where the scissors go and then give the cell another piece of DNA that allows a, the DNA to be repaired in a particular way, then you've got it. Now, one of the current problems with CRISPR and other genome editing technologies is, is an important one. It's called off-target effects. What does this mean? Well. We, we would like to think that our scissors are positioned precisely with 100% accuracy. And that's just not the case currently. Sometimes those scissors go awry and they cut in, a, in the wrong place. And this can cause unintended mutations in addition to the one that you're trying to produce using CRISPR-Cas9 editing. So uh, if I mention off-target effects, it, it, that's what it means. And that's all you need to know is that we, it's the, it's the problem of unintended consequences of this technology. Uh, now, uh, this technology is rapidly improving. The accuracy is, is uh, being refined. Uh, probably as we're sitting here, somebody's in a laboratory making a better version of a genome editing kit for this kind of technology. All right, so uh, that's how it works. What do we use it for? So since Cindy mentioned agriculture, I'll just mention a couple of non-human examples, just so you know where this is headed in our, in our society. Probably good that you know it. One is my lab. So this is an embryo from my lab. This is a little worm embryo, and it's glowing because we took a protein called beta-catenin and glued a, a piece of a protein um, that was originally derived from jellyfish and then mutated so it glows in a different color to the first protein so we can watch the protein in living embryos as it's glowing using fancy microscopes. So that's, that's from my lab. And uh, people in my line of work do this all the time these days. But it's also being used in agriculture. Here's one of my favorite early examples. So I, I'm from the America's Dairyland, Wisconsin. We have cows there, right? So um, here is a, a bovine over here and it has little horns. This is a juvenile um, bull here. And those horns are a problem when those, when those juvenile bulls get a little frisky and bump into each other. So these are genome edited 
cattle that lack horns. So this is just a, it's not really cosmetic, I guess it's important in the cattle industry, um, you get the idea. But we are, are applying CRISPR technology to all kinds of food crops in the plant world and to animals, as Cindy mentioned. Another uh, proposed use of this is in something called gene drives. And because these edits are inherited and can be passed on to the next generation, if you make a fancy engineered piece of DNA and you engineer mosquitoes, then those mosquitoes will pass on that edited DNA. And this particular edit causes the mos mosquitoes, the baby mosquitoes, to be sterile so they can't reproduce anymore. And uh, so if you introduce this in a small population of mosquitoes, they can propagate it. And that's something called a gene drive. And there are lots of concerns about what that might do to ecosystems and those kinds of things. But uh, the, the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has put a lot of money into this technology. Uh, another use is in xenotransplantation. This is the idea that we can take an organ from another animal and transplant it into a human. And the, the most often mentioned species are pigs. And so George Church, who I mentioned earlier, his lab has been involved in making multiple gene edits to pigs to remove offending genes which cause the expression of proteins that cause humans to uh, engage in immune rejection of the pig tissue. So this might, might help uh, organ shortages for organ donation, that sort of thing. So lots of uses in non-humans. But what we want to talk about are the applications to humans. So let's do that. And um, there are two main applications. One is to make edits in cells that are part of the body. Those are called somatic cells. So let's talk about that first. Then later we'll talk about so-called germline editing, edits that can be passed on from one generation to the next because they wind up in eggs and sperm. All right. So uh, these somatic cells are cells in the body. And uh, here, then, the edits are not transmitted. We might edit some of your cells, but you would not be able to pass that on to a subsequent generation. And there are clinical trials underway right now in the US that use somatic cell editing. The most prominent, probably, is to treat certain cases of sickle cell anemia. I'll talk about that in a moment. Another prevalent example, and some of that in the most important research in that area in terms of clinical trials is, is, has been happening at Penn. Uh, and that's chimeric antigen receptor T or CAR T cell therapy. These are engineered cells that are particularly aggressive at recognizing tumor cells in your body and attacking them, basically hyperdriving your immune system to attack tumor cells in your body. Uh, and there are other kinds of things. There's something called relapse non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that's in clinical trials. There's something called labor congenital uh, amaurosis. This causes uh, a form of blindness. So this was in 2019, and there are additional clinical trials being proposed all the time at this point. So let's talk about that first one, sickle cell, just to give you a sense for how this kind of engineering can be incredibly useful. So uh, sickle cell anemia is caused by a mutated form of a subunit of the protein hemoglobin, which you've probably heard about. It's the oxygen-carrying protein in your blood cells. Patients who carry this mutation, and there's a related disease called beta thalassemia, similar kind of situation, their hemoglobin doesn't play nice. It causes the formation of long strands, which causes changes in the shape of the blood cells, so they clog arteries. That's what sickle cell anemia causes. And the mutations in the, the hemoglobin gene are known. And, and the uh, basic mechanism is known uh, with a lot of precision. Now, it turns out, and uh, you know, we have an expert, we have a, a pediatrician with us, so she'll know a lot more about this. But you express a different kind of hemoglobin subunit when you're a fetus. But that stops being made as you grow, as you're born and then you grow. But it turns out that this particular therapy, in this case, involves making an edit in a gene down here, this yellow guy, that regulates the turning off of that fetal hemoglobin. So in, in the normal case, you stop making fetal hemoglobin, you switch to a different one, and that's what adults make. 
But the therapy here is to cause that fetal form of hemoglobin to start being made again in the blood cell precursors called hematopoietic stem cells that make blood cells. And it turns out if you, uh, that fetal hemoglobin works, and if you make enough of that fetal hemoglobin, you prevent the formation of these long strands with the bad subunit of hemoglobin. So you can prevent the sickle cell phenotype, the sickle cell trait from appearing in the blood cells of these patients. And this appears to be working. So there are patients who've been treated in this way. Their blood cells have been edited. They've been reintroduced into the bone marrow of these patients. And it's dramatic. Like in a, in a week or two, they start feeling better. This has changed the lives of a number of sickle cell patients. I think we're going to see this as uh, a therapy that's widely employed. The second uh, technology I mentioned, CAR T cells, those are being used uh, in lots of clinical trials right now. What these cells are is this, this is an immune cell, this yellow guy, and he's attacking this, attacking this tumor cell here. And he actually is going to trigger the death of the pink guy when they interact. And these engineered uh, CAR T cells have engineered proteins sticking out of their surface that can interact with the tumor cell over here and facilitate this process. And um, these edits can be done to your immune cells and they can be introduced back into you and that can help you fight off the tumors that might be in your body. So I think people are very excited about this somatic cell application of CRISPR. Now there are potential widespread uses in, in other ways. Uh, in 2016, or 2006 I should say, uh, Shinya Yamanaka pictured here uh, did work to identify ways of engineering human specialized cells so that they lose their specialization and become something called induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, Yamanaka got a piece of the Nobel Prize for this very important work. And why is this potentially important? Well, you can take specialized cells, let's say your skin cells, and they're your cells. It means they're immunologically matched to you so that you can, uh, if they're introduced back into you, you will not reject them like you might cells from someone else. Then it turns out Yamanaka found if you make these cells make four proteins, which are now called Yamanaka factors, these cells will lose their specialization and they will become cells that are incredibly developmentally flexible. They can be tweaked to form lots of different specialized cells. Having that property is known as being pluripotent. It's a big word. All you need to know is they're super flexible. And so you can push them to make things like muscle or blood cells or nerve cells or other kinds of tissues. And uh, so these iPS cells are, uh, people are, are very excited about them for the potential for what's called regenerative medicine, replacing damaged or lost tissue. So these are all examples of somatic cell genome editing for human therapy. But there's another kind of editing that we can engage in. It's called germline editing. Well, what is that? Germline editing means the edit can be transmitted to the next generation through oocytes, eggs, or sperm. Now, what's the difference? Huge difference. One difference is these edits are permanent in the sense that uh, once they get into the germline, they are going to be transmitted to the next generation. So if we make a germline edit, we need to understand that there are going to be consequences for the offspring of the individual in which the germline edit was made. And that has much wider implications for what we are doing to engineer over time the human genome. It turns out this is really easy. So, you know, my little worm embryos and CRISPR is pretty easy. It's super easy in mammals, including primates. So uh, this is from 2014. We've been able to do this now for a while. This is an example of macaques, monkeys. And um, you, just, you just inject all of the molecules you need to do the edit, and you let the egg do the rest. And um, when this edit is performed, uh, 
A number of the cells derived from the fertilized egg will contain the edit. And if some of those cells make the germ cells, the eggs or the sperm of that individual, they will be passed on to the next generation. So the edited monkey embryo makes this cute little, goes into a surrogate mother and then makes these cute little baby monkeys. If those baby monkeys carry the edit in their cells that will make sperm or eggs, then when they become not so baby monkeys, and they become, uh, they, they can generate their, their own offspring, then it will be passed on. See, see how that works? This was originally developed in mice. If you can do it in mice, it's almost always true you can do it in primates, as this experiment showed. And if you can do it in a macaque, guess what other species of primate you can do it in? Yeah, it's humans, we'll get to that. So uh, here are the first macaques that were born, these cinemologous monkeys, and um, they're, they're cute, aren't they? So, so this, this will work. It's clear it's gonna work. And so Chinese scientists in 2015, based on these results from the uh, uh, Mipolitov group in the Oregon Health Sciences University, decided to perform edits on human embryos, and this made nature news, as you can see here. And this kicked in a response from a lot of thoughtful people, including my friend Francis Collins. He's currently the director of the National Institutes of Health, but he was instrumental in um, curating uh, the draft human genome as the, the NIH's director of the Human Genome Project. And here's what Francis said. The concept of altering the human germline in embryos for clinical purposes has been viewed almost universally as a line that should not be crossed. That's because of the import of germline editing for future generations. If we don't really know what the unintended consequences are of the germline edits, then uh, according to Francis at this time, it would be irresponsible to pursue these kinds of experiments. Now, this is different from somatic cell editing, which is not transmitted uh, to future generations. Well, uh, some of the scientists involved in this project, including Fen Zhang here, who I mentioned earlier, got together in a summit in December of 2015. They recommended at that time, we should not use this technology to establish a human pregnancy. But that was really mainly for safety and efficacy issues. We can't guarantee there won't be off-target effects, so we uh, would not be responsible at this point in the development of the technology to do this. And they said, well, we need broad societal consensus, whatever that might look like. We can talk about whether that can be, is achievable. That's something we might discuss. Uh, but they did recommend cautious development of medical applications that cannot be passed to offspring. That's somatic cell editing. All right, so that's 2015. 2017, the National Academies of Science weighed in with similar recommendations. They called for prohibiting any alterations resembling enhancement. Now, I put this in quotes. Why did I do that? Because one person's view of enhancement differs radically from another person's view, and we'll want to talk about that. We'll want to think hard about that. Very important. Secondly, um, they recommended that, that the edits should be limited to taking a flavor of a gene, which geneticists call an allele, and editing it to a different flavor, but that is one of the standard flavors on offering. So, you know, if you imagine a store with lots of standard flavors of ice cream, we want it to be one of the standard flavors, not some exotic flavor of the week. So, um, uh, and, and in this case, you, you, you want to change it to a flavor of that gene that's present in lots of humans out there. So the idea was if you're gonna restore a broken version of a gene, you wanna restore it to something that's kind of a standard version that other people have. All right, so what did they say about germline edits? Well, this is where it gets interesting. Clinical trials of germline alteration, quote, might be permitted, but quote, only for compelling reasons. What compelling reasons might you ask? Well, here's the one that was mentioned. Limited to couples for whom embryo editing is, quote, really the last reasonable option for a biological child. So the idea would be that we, we might do germline editing in the case of uh, uh, 
uh, a couple who would otherwise bear children who carry uh, a devastating genetic disorder. And because of this uh, imperative that they might want to have their own biologically related child, this would be a permissible use of germline editing. So uh, that was 2017. And my colleague Alta Charo in the law school at UW-Madison was, was on this committee. All right, well, I think surprisingly to a lot of people, the same group who had done the cloning in monkeys that I mentioned earlier, uh, they actually had done cloning in humans as well. They're very good with their technology. They did the first edits on a human embryo in 2017. Uh, so, uh, this again was the Mitpolitov group. And um, what did they do? They edited a gene to repair a mutation in a particular gene which leads to cardiomyopathy in large hearts in young adults. So they took human embryos that carried this mutation and they edited that gene to replace the mutated form of this gene with a more normal form of the gene that produces a more normal protein. Now, they didn't allow the embryos to develop, but the evidence is very compelling in this paper in the journal Nature that they were able to do this gene edit. So why uh, did they uh, do this particular experiment? Well, the, uh, there, there are certain genes which, when mutated, cause very specific human disease states. And it is known that they are due to that single mutated gene. So if you can fix that gene, you will permanently fix the transmission of that mutation to subsequent generations. So that's the stated motivation for these kinds of experiments. Again, they did not allow the embryos to develop. Well, so that was a game changer, I think. But this was a bigger game changer. This is He Jiang Qiu, and uh, he is from the Southern University of Science and Technology of China um, in Shenzhen. And um, he announced at a summit, a CRISPR summit in uh, 2018 in November, that he had performed the first edits on um, human embryos uh, in, in which the human embryos were implanted into a womb and developed to term and were born. So he edited a gene called CCR5. This is a protein that's been implicated in resistance to contracting AIDS when, ex when cells are exposed to the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. And it turns out that the, the parents of the, or the father of the two uh, girls whose pseudonyms were Lulu and Nana, was HIV positive. So the claim was, we're gonna help these girls not to contract, not, not to get AIDS from their father. That was the, the rationale. Uh, well, this caused a firestorm. So here's Francis again. Uh, and I'm just gonna quote him at length. Uh, I think you will not mistake his, his meaning. This was a profoundly unfortunate, ill-considered, epic scientific misadventure that flouted international ethical norms and was largely carried out in secret with utterly unconvincing justifications. I think many people condemned her for these experiments. There is a sense in which he appeared to just want to be the first person to do this kind of an experiment. Um, and, uh, but Francis was just one of many who reacted in this way. And so that led to the NIH hitting the pause button on this in March 2019. Of course, Francis directing the NIH. But also an international moratorium on heritable genome editing, which contained a lot of heavy hitters in uh, human genome biology and other related technologies. That was in 2019. So this is a voluntary moratorium um, on, on human genome editing. Now, I think that hitting the pause button was valuable and really important. Many people have made the case that we should not restrict the discussions about who gets to use genome editing, especially germline editing, and when we would use it, to a group of scientists who are themselves pushing the technology. That seems odd. And so here's Ben Hurlbut from Arizona State University. And he and, and others have, have uh, suggested that we develop a, a worldwide 
genome editing observatory, he calls it. And here's what he said in an op-ed piece in 2019 in the journal Nature. In calling for standards for producing such CRISPR-edited babies, these leaders have shunted aside a crucial and as yet unanswered question, whether it is or ever can be acceptable to genetically engineer children by introducing changes that they'll pass on to their own offspring. That question belongs not to science, but to all of humanity. And I think Ben, who I've met once, he's a very thoughtful guy, um, I think he's onto something here. That we, in case you've forgotten, we are part of humanity here in this room. And so we need to be part of these discussions, and that's why we're here this morning. Now, uh, in addition to the purveyors of the technology, there are some deep pockets who are very interested in the potential of genome editing. And it's part of a larger program that could be considered part of a very large topic that we don't have time to discuss called transhumanism. Can we make human beings better? Now, the first step of that would be eliminating, somehow eliminating all human disease that's genetically based. And you may recognize this guy, it's Mark Zuckerberg and his wife, Priscilla Chan. The Chan Zuckerberg Initiative is very motivated to fund work on uh, uh, elimination of human disease through genome editing. Now, um, this is an incredibly ambitious title on the slide behind them. And I would say it's true that uh, these two maybe don't understand the complexities of the task. But many of us don't. This is, I mean, it's complicated. Uh, now, uh, one issue that's been raised is if you look at who's funding a lot of this is, well, these guys have financial resources that I certainly don't have. And will this perpetuate economic inequities in healthcare? So that's, a, that's another question that we might ask. We have healthcare professional here, and we can, we can maybe talk about that if you want. Uh, so let's talk for a minute about why it's going to be challenging. I think that's the, the hope one day is, wouldn't we all like to cure disease? Yes, of course we would. No question. So no one in this room, I think, would dispute that. I certainly don't. But why is it going to be challenging? Well, most traits are not single gene traits. So sickle cell anemia is a single gene trait. You fix that broken gene, you're going to fix the disease. But most traits that make, make up the aspects of who we are as biological individuals are not like that. One problem is a single gene and the, and the protein that is made based on the information from that gene has multiple roles in lots of different processes. That's a, pro, a situation that geneticists call pleiotropy. So pleiotropy means I've got one gene, but we need that gene for lots of different traits. There's a converse problem, and that's the problem of what's called a multi or polygenic trait. In this case, to realize a particular characteristic that you have, we need a boatload of genes all doing their thing properly. And we need to know exactly how much of the products of those genes are required, how they interact, how they interact with lots of other things happening all at the same time. And so in this case, you've got a bunch of different genes and they're all required for one trait. So in the top case, if you monkey with the gene, you may have lots of consequences for lots of different things, hard to control. In the bottom situation, which is maybe more common and more challenging, we, maybe we have to make edits in lots of different genes and we've got to make exactly the right edits and all these proteins need to be expressed at the right level so we've got enough or, but not too much of those proteins in the cells that are required to express that trait. And so that's going to be really complicated. But I think uh, there's some geneticists thinking hard about, could we pull this off one day? Uh, and here's just an example. This is from November 25th. Uh, this is from the journal Nature. And this is discussing the largest study that I know of, at least. And this is looking at the bits of DNA that provide the information for um, making proteins in humans. And they looked at 450,000 individuals. They sequenced the DNA from all of those people. And they looked at what flavors of genes across all of the genes, uh, you know, 20,000 or so genes in the genome, and looked at the variations. And then they correlated that with whether people had various kinds of diseases. These are called genome-wide association studies. 
All you need to know is people are starting to look in this way. So if we could catalog and correlate, and we have a statistician here who when I say the word correlation, he knows a lot more than I do. So we can talk to him about probability and statistics later. Um, but th the idea is to correlate particular flavors of genes with particular states of health. So then if we could, we could push the DNA towards states of health that are, are uh, cause humans to be biologically more flourishing, that would be the ultimate goal one day. But this is gonna be really challenging. So, uh, whoops, I didn't provide all the publication information here. This is from the New England Journal of Medicine up here. Uh, and this is from a journal called eLife. And both of these papers talk about the, the law of diminishing returns on polygenic traits. When you've got lots of genes that you've got to tweak to, to think about a particular trait. It's going to be incredibly challenging because as the number of genes increases, you have all of these trade-offs you've got to deal with. So there's this huge trade-off problem in going in and deliberately trying to monkey with particular genes. And I, all I want to say by this is that's a super technical discussion that um, I'm not an expert, but just realize that that's a problem. Now I have thought about one multigenic trait a lot. It's autism. Uh, for most autistic people, uh, there, there's good evidence that there's a solid genetic component to the development of autism spectrum disorders. Why have I thought about that a lot? Well, because of this guy. This is my son, Christopher. He's 32. Uh, my other son, John, here is driving a much fancier car than I drive, which is my hand-me-down Toyota here that you can see in the background. And, um, uh, Christopher has profound autism. He's severely disabled. And um, he lives at home with my wife, Susie, and me. And uh, I've thought about this a lot. I take Christopher on a long drive every Saturday in the country, and um, we spend a lot of time together on Saturdays. My wife spends a lot of time with Christopher going on what we call adventures uh, in the Madison area during the week. And we've thought a lot about this. Uh, and uh, But the problem is that... Uh, there are a few uh, examples of autism that are, 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 seem to be mainly caused by single gene mutations, but most examples of autism don't seem to be like that. So trying to repair, in a genetic sense, the, the deficits that lead to a propensity for autism is going to be incredibly challenging. Now, in, in our case, uh, would we like to, to repair... Uh, defects in Christopher's neurons in his brain that, that cause his disability. I, you know, I think if that were possible, we, we maybe would have loved to have been able to do that. Uh, as a Christian, of course, I wouldn't trade Christopher for anything. He's a part of our family, and his name, Christopher, means um, uh, Christ bearer. And what we didn't anticipate is that in caring for Christopher, we would be drawn closer to Jesus, whom, whom we serve, and a part of loving Christopher is part of our service to him. So it's gonna be challenging, um, but wow, uh, the, the commercial sector is really hot on this stuff. So here's from a journal, The Economist. This is from 2019. I picked this image because it's disturbing to me. What's disturbing about this? This is like Yelp applied to genetics. And so we're gonna pick the embryo that's the five-star embryo somehow, right? So we're gonna assay embryos. We're gonna make embryos by in vitro fertilization. Somehow we're gonna assess their genotype, the genes they have, and which flavors of every gene they have. And somehow we're gonna apply some sort of statistical filter, and we're going to pick the best embryos. If you've seen the movie Gattaca, that's what they are doing in the movie Gattaca. So the best and the brightest embryos make it to birth. Um, and what, what's evident, what, what, sorry, what's evident is that uh, these kinds of, of headlines don't really appreciate the complexities of the biology. But you're gonna see a lot more of these as time goes on. So we need thoughtful interrogators of the private sector and the public sector on these issues. And hopefully that's people in this room. All right, so finally, let's discuss from a Christian perspective, since I'm a Christian, how we should think about this technology. 
Well, first it's probably worth pointing out, and this is a, an older uh, survey, so things may have changed, but there is a correlation between religious adherence and reluctance to push genome editing in the germline forward. So people who have high religious commitment in this Pew survey were less um, uh, favorable towards this technology. They had more problems with it than people with low religious commitment. And what that means is that people who are faithful religious adherents, including people in the Christian community, need to be part of these discussions. Because I can tell you, on average, my colleagues are not a particularly religious bunch. And they're the scientists moving a lot of these technologies forward. So um, I think that's my plea is for all of us in this room is that it's, it's your business to be involved in these discussions, and I hope you will. Now, one of the key issues here, which I think Christian faith informs, is this one. This is Jennifer Doudna, Nobel laureate for CRISPR technology. And uh, she said this, well, one woman, the mother of a child with Down syndrome, explained, I love my child and wouldn't change him. There's something special about him. The scientist, Jennifer, at this point, teared up telling the story, and she said, it makes you think hard about what it means to be human, doesn't it? And I can appreciate that comment about a Down syndrome child given my, my own son's disability. But I think Dowden is onto something. This is one of the key questions. What is the essence of being human? Especially if you think about trying to improve the human condition beyond uh, repairing profound disease states. What's human flourishing going to look like? Science can't answer that question. To see why this is so, uh, here's Peter Singer. Here's what he said. So he's a well-known bioethicist. He said, uh, talking about human embryos, in this respect, experimenting on a human embryo is not to be compared in significance with experimenting on a living, sentient mouse. So for him, there's really not any distinctive features of human beings. So that's one view of the human condition, but let's think about that from a Christian perspective. And here, I agree with V. Elving Anderson. Um, Elving was a human geneticist at the University of Minnesota. He said, what inner resources will individuals have for coping with future discoveries? That is a great question. It's sometimes claimed that questions of the future will be so unique that old values will be inadequate. But I've not found any basic question that will not profit con from consideration of a biblical perspective. The Christian scriptures can provide us guidance in what does it mean, in essence, to be human. So uh, let's talk about the nature of humans and biblical worldview. I quote from a bit of Hebrew poetry, and we have an Old Testament scholar in our midst. This is Psalm 139. Uh, in other venues, I, I show some of the Hebrew words in this poem, but I'm not going to do that today. <laughs> the dust off my seminary education that Cindy mentioned. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, but uh, I quote this to my students of, of embryonic, in my embryonic development course. And um, part of the psalm says this, you form my inward parts, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. That, that verb for knit is uh, a Hebrew word that's used elsewhere in making tapestries. So the psalmist has an idea of process. He doesn't know anything about embryos especially pre-implantation embryos, but, but he does know that, that there's an embryonic process. But most importantly, in Psalm 139, God was there during that entire process. So God cared about the psalmist before he was born. What's more we can say when we look at the first chapter of Genesis that one of the chief uh, features of humans is that we are God's image bearers. We are his vice regents in the world. And that means we need to act as stewards, which is, is there also in the first chapter of Genesis as well as in the second chapter. Moreover, children are begotten gifts. Psalm 127 talks about blessed is the person whose quiver is full of them. Great metaphor. Children are a gift, not a product. And in particular, the weak deserve special consideration. And there are lots of Old Testament passages that, that speak to that very, very explicitly. 
A biblical worldview also suggests extreme caution here. Why is that? Well, we should recognize the tendencies of humans for what the Bible calls sin, sinful behavior. But it's not just our sinful humanness. If you go back to the second chapter of Genesis, maybe you remember, this is before the bad thing happens in chapter three, which theologians call the fall. Do you remember what God tells the humans? They're not supposed to do something, remember that? They're not supposed to eat something. Anybody remember that? They're not supposed to eat of the tree of? The knowledge of good and evil, yeah. So God was placing a constraint on them before they entered into disobedience. So humans have limitations. But that only gets worse in the next chapter, of course. Then they they make a, a poor choice it has drastic consequences for the future of humanity. And it's because of that that Christians affirm that uh, the second person of the Trinity came among us, lived, and died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8 says. So that makes humans supremely valuable. Now, uh, The last thing I want to say, and this is an interesting thing to think about, is that Christ-likeness and union with Christ is the goal of human existence, not biological perfection. We can see that in passages like 1 John 3, verse 2, where, where John says, you know, we don't know what we're going to be like, but we're going to be transformed, and we're going to see Jesus as he really is in his essence, and that's going to require some transformation of us in order to stand in his glorious presence in that way. And moreover, we can say that the perfect human, Jesus, didn't need to have his genome edited. So we need to think about the the, the sense of true flourishing, true perfection from these kinds of perspectives. That said, I think there's a balancing act here. First of all, uh, I think we've already said that we should seek to treat humans as patients In the Christian perspective, that means that human beings are ends, not means, at all life stages. And that we should seek to use technology for the benefit of humans, beneficence. But we should be wary of excessive technological optimism. The notion that we're going to fix all human problems through technology, it's what I call the Star Trek view of the world, if you're a sci-fi fan. They've abolished all human ailments due to the greatness of science. I think uh, the biblical worldview says that is an unrealistic perspective. But treating humans as patients and avoiding technological optimism then puts us in tension. We want to help people, but we know that we need constraints on the use of technology and we sense that there need to be limits. So how do we balance those? All right, so let's evaluate germline genome editing from this perspective, shall we? Well, as I've said before, current technologies cannot guarantee that there won't be off-target effects. So most people think right now that we're just not ready to even think about this, but I'm sure people will push this forward using private funding in various places in the world. Moreover, uh, something I'm troubled by is that um, many of these experiments, like the Metpolitoff editing experiment involve destruction of human embryos upon which experiments have been performed. And uh, that means that current technology really can't treat individual human beings in their earliest stages of life as patients easily. And I think a looming question here is the problem of eugenics. We're really struggling with this at University of Wisconsin. We've unearthed a history of thinking about eugenics, you know, Breeding for the common good, basically, from the early 20th century, which is very popular in the United States among uh, intellectuals. And we're dealing with that. Well, this makes uh, the, the possibilities of genes for a better tomorrow much more of a real possibility through direct manipulation. And we're all going to have to think about that. And one of the issues here, I think, is remember I said that um, Human beings, in particular children, are gifts, not products. Uh, This is part of a problem which ethicists call commodification. 
So here's Francis again. He said this, the application of germline manipulation would change our view of the value of human life. If genomes are being altered to suit parents' preferences, do children become more like commodities than precious gifts? And I think there's a clear sense taken very far that's absolutely gonna be true. Uh, on the other hand, um, there's also a sense in which parents want the best for their kids. So, you know, there's gonna be a lot of pressure for these kinds of edits that are not to alter uh, life-threatening disease states. And of course, we need to be in dialogue with people who don't share our worldview commitments. Here's George Church again. He's, he's feisty, he's got great quotes. So I've just ripped one off here. Um, Church said this, if these fixes for severe diseases are shown to be safe and effective, why would small or large enhancements accompanying the fixes be unacceptable? So what's going on here? Uh, Church is basically saying, okay, we're gonna pop the genetic hood. And you know, we need to do a little engine maintenance in there, but while we got the hood open, hey, let's do a few upgrades, why not? He doesn't see any problem with that. Many of us would be much more uncomfortable with these kinds of uh, suggestions of enhancement. And moreover, one of the things that we have to talk about with enhancement is enhancement towards what? What is the goal of enhancement? Now, often not discussed is that de-enhancement is possible. So, uh, you know, I go on these long drives with my son Christopher. I read uh, Brave New World by Aldous Huxley again as an audio book fairly recently. And if Huxley had known about genome engineering, wow, it would have been right in that novel, wouldn't it, uh, if you've read that novel. It's possible, we don't like to talk about it because we think everyone will do the right thing with technology. But as humans, we need to be wary of, of that simplicity. Paul Ramsey, an ethicist at Princeton in a really groundbreaking book in, um, that was written 50 years ago now, uh, Fabricated Man, apologize for the non-neutrality of his gender references here. Um, so I'll just edit this on the fly here. Um, people ought not to play God before they learn to be people. And after they've learned to be people, they will not play God. And I appreciate what Ramsey is saying here, that we should not presume to have the wisdom that only God has. On the other hand, we said Genesis 1 calls us to be stewards. And that probably, or at least we should discuss whether it should involve stewarding our own genomes. So the question here is, can we be God's vice regents in stewarding our genomes for human flourishing? How we might think about that is incredibly challenging, and I hope we'll, we'll discuss that in the panel discussion. Let's just end with a, a final statement from Francis, who I think has been an incredibly great voice for modern biomedical technology but also Christian sensibilities, and I really appreciate everything that he has done. Humility would be a great, a very good principle to attach to any such discussion. And I just say amen to that. So what are the next steps? Well, that's what we're gonna engage in now. Be informed, I've tried to help with that a little. Be critical thinkers, that is really important. And be loving advocates. And that's what I hope we can do in this room in what follows. Thanks very much, appreciate your attention. Thank you so much. That was uh, a beautifully crafted blend of intense scientific data and really beautiful theological thinking at the same time, which I appreciate. Um, we're gonna do just quick, if anyone has um, like, this, like one or two or three uh, immediate questions for Jeff Harden, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, I'll find the mic and we can do that real quick. Great, um, if not, what we're gonna do is like a quick break. You can top off your coffee and eat more donuts um, while we kind of like do a scene shift up here up front, but any quick, was that a question? Okay. Oh, here it is. So you talked about, um, well, two things, like the legal battles in involving the 
uh, commercialization of the technology and how uh, the precautions that we might give on federal funding don't necessarily apply to private practice. If a billionaire funds it, they can do whatever they want. Um, but that seems to apply at all levels. Like in the future, if we mostly as a society agree, oh, we shouldn't do these things, billionaires can still fund whatever research they want to, you know, uh, biologically enhance their kids, regardless of what we as a society may think. And that seems to be sort of a problem with this discussion where people can kind of just circumvent the whole thing and just do whatever they want. Do you know any resources about that? Jurassic Park problem, right? So, you know, you, um, this is genome editing to make dinosaurs in the case of Jurassic Park, but you're right. Um, and it's worse because the international landscape of legislation is quite a mosaic of various different approaches. The U.S. historically has been very hands-off on federal legislation. So what's worse in the U.S. is we have, a, we have all the states can make their own laws, and they do. And that sends scientists who don't like those laws to different places to do their, their research. Um, but there is no international agreement there's no like Rio Accords for genome editing so far. You know, I'm hoping that we that that would actually be possible. And um, but you're right that we don't have that. Will we ever be able to stop the maniacal rich person from circumventing ethical restraints? I'm not sure that we can. Um, but we can certainly slow them down, and I think that's all we can expect here. Now. You know, I kind of set up the presentation to, to, for you to have in your mind, oh, Mark Zuckerberg, Meta, you know, what's he going to fund, right? So I, um, I don't really know exactly what, in his mind's eye, the outcomes would be. I just know from the little news clips, right? Um, but, you know, guys like Elon Musk is another guy. You know, these guys in Silicon Valley, there's a certain group of them who really want to push these technologies forward and, and incorporate technological enhancements to our brains and, you know, cryopreservation, all kinds of other stuff that's part of a, a larger package. And I am concerned about that. So I think, you know, the only thing that works with business people is if you don't buy their products, they lose their revenue. So people need to influence the market in a way that forces the private sector to realize that they need to be ethically responsible. Now, that, it's naive to think we're going to completely curtail all of this, I think. I think we can we can have a big impact on this, and I hope hope that we will. Makes sense. I uh, I have um, like I know a lot of people in like the Silicon Valley area, so all the tech bros and transhumanism stuff is something I'm very familiar with. <laughs> uh, That's a great question. Maybe we can talk more about that during the panel discussion too. At the other end of the spectrum, for the common person, it's increasingly popular to do DNA testing just out of curiosity. What's your opinion about that? Yeah, I mean, 23andMe, Ancestry.com, those kinds of places. Um, you know, I think there a lot of good comes out of those. Um, sometimes you realize that you're, you have a familial mutation in a gene you didn't know you were carrying, and um, that can be very valuable. Uh, and then, you know, the, the main stated purpose of Ancestry.com is to map your family history, right? Um, here's the problem, here's the danger. Um, the average person doesn't understand how gen molecular genetics works very well. So Cindy thought this was pretty complicated discussion. It wasn't. And so there's a lot of complexity. So the average person just really can't evaluate what their genome data means. So, you know, the fact that you have a particular set of genome-wide associated flavors of particular genes means you might have an increased risk of disease X, let's say. It doesn't mean you're going to get disease X. Um, that's not how probabilities work. And so you do have to be careful about um, over-interpreting this data. Uh, the other thing is that uh, this data is really good at tracking uh, 
certain ancestors because they were geographically isolated for a really long period of time before there was lots of admixture among different groups of humans, before worldwide travel became prevalent. And so that works great for certain isolated areas, but it's getting increasingly more difficult to pinpoint your family history because of all the mixing of, of the genetic bits in there. So, the, you know, just that practical use is going to be complicated. Um, I have not done this. I, just out of curiosity, how many people have done um, genome testing if you're willing to self-identify? Anybody willing to identify? Okay, I haven't done that. I have thought about that in the case of, because of our son, because there's a genetic component to, to autism. Uh, and we're certainly thinking about having Christopher's genome completely sequenced. You know, the costs have come down so much that now it's, it's eminently economically feasible to, to most people to, to do this. So I think we'll probably do that. And, well, I, I, my wife and I have to talk about this, but I, I probably would favor putting Christopher into a genome-wide association study for people on the autism spectrum disorder. Um, but the main problem is the one that the Economist article pointed out. Um, it's great for headline grabs, but it's not really ac an accurate understanding of how genomes work and how they influence uh, human health and disease. And so I think the main thing I'm concerned about from 23andMe in particular is, you know, you used to get back this whole panel of what diseases you were susceptible to and those kinds of things. They backed way off of that because of somebody sued them, I think. And I, I, I don't work for a hospital. We, we have someone here who can maybe address that better. Um, so I think that's my main concern is the overinterpretation. And, you know, the mistakes are made in the sequencing, too, so you have to take that with a grain of salt, too. And you are, so the you're down you're, the road risk of participating. You are. So, so there are a couple of issues. One is, do you want your genome information out there? So one of the concerns has always been that an insurance company could look at your genome if they get access to your genome data and say, oh, you've got a higher susceptibility to, well, we mentioned cardiomyopathy. So you have a higher susceptibility to heart attacks, let's say. And uh, look at that and, and say, we're not going to insure you. So that's been a huge part of the discussion in the states is to place incredibly strong firewalls in place so insurance companies cannot get access to individual genome data. So that's a concern. I think that's another reason why many people have, have decided not to do this. On the other hand, we're all familiar with crowdsourcing. And there are lots of scientific projects that involve crowdsourcing now, meteorological projects, for example, and um, adding to the, the number of individuals who have complete genome sequence data is valuable from a scientific perspective. But we have to work incredibly hard because if somebody hacks that data and it gets out there in the wild, it's not just your password that pops up on your iPhone and says you need to change your password. It's going to be vital information about your genome. So. Uh, I'm not well equipped to talk about how we might safeguard that. It sounds like there are people who are more technologically savvy in the audience here who could maybe address that. 